Okay, so as Sangmuk told you all, I'm going to talk about early art magnetism and progress and perspectives. And I originally in my abstract for this talk said I would cover two aspects, general aspects. One would be uh, the Izu Bonin Mariana system and how it started at least its in, uh, first few million years, but also then talk about uh, the characteristics of back art from the North Fiji Basin through to the Lao Basin. But when I prepared this talk, I realized I have an overwhelming amount of material just to tell you uh, what's happened in terms of Izu Bon in Mariana research. So that's where uh, I'm going to concentrate for this afternoon's talk. Perhaps we could talk about the back arcs, North Fiji and Lao on some other occasion. How do I do the next slide? Oh, here we go. All right, so because this is an interridge seminar, I thought I would emphasize the seafloor spreading aspect of the early arc systems. And the cartoons on the left are uh, an attempt by Osama Ishizuka and colleagues in a paper in Elements to compare the Izu Bonin Mariana four arc, what you can observe from submersibles and dredging that's currently exposed on the trench wall of the Izu Bonin system. And comparing that with the classic Trudos and Samael Ophiolites. And of course, the analogy is being drawn here by uh, Ishizuka-san, that uh, much of the classic stratigraphy of, bonnet, of Ophiolites is mimicked by the earliest stages of development of the Izu Bonin Mariana arc system. So seafloor spreading, of course, is uh, well known. It's supposed to be oceanic crust or representative of it. And ophiolites have been a critical uh, example, field example, of what people perceive to be uh, the results of seafloor spreading. And for a long time, ophiolites were really not understood. Then they became equated with processes at big mid-ocean ridges. And then a paper in the 70s by uh, Miyashiro-san suggested heretically that maybe Trudos wasn't developed in, uh, at a mid-ocean ridge, it was developed in an island arc setting. And I say heretical because this, his paper received uh, a lot of comment and the main objections were primarily that, well, we don't see tensional systems in arcs, we don't see sheeted dike systems, we don't see single uh, isolated strata volcanoes in the Trudos, where is the apron of debris from isolated strata volcanoes that intrude us that might one, one might expect and so on. So that was a, a common view that, well, it's a minority of people that thought something like the Trudos was made in an island arc, but that hypothesis was subsequently developed by many workers. I've just mentioned Julian Pierce, Bob Stern, Sean Bloomer, and so on and so on. So it's now become accepted that the majority of Ophiolites we can visit are in fact made probably in an island arc setting or an arc system setting. And this is the paper that that cartoon on the left is drawn from uh, in, in elements. And I'm, I will attempt to give you lots of uh, references to the material that I'm showing you so that, for example, you may not want to write it down, down now, but you could look at the recording of this talk and obtain all the references that I'm using uh, to convince yourself that's, that's the material that I'm talking about. And if you wanted to know something about the history of thought about from Ophiolites to subduction zones, uh, we wrote a paper which was published in a special issue of Oceanography about the 50th anniversary of scientific ocean drilling uh, a couple of years ago. So here is the, an example of uh, a cross section of an island arc system. And the point I wanted to make about this is that and not all these elements are necessarily present in any one arc, uh, that this is a system that developed uh, to the point where we can see it now with a volcanic front uh, indicated by the arrow and reference to the volcanic front. And this is an important point I want to make. We recognize places that are called fore arc in front, trenchwood of the volcanic front, rear arc, rearward, away from the trench from the volcanic front and back arc basins when they are developed. Without the presence of a volcanic front, none of these terms make any sense really. Rear arc, fore arc, back arc, the axis, the, the chain of volcanoes that is closest to the trench that defines the limit of magnetism 
in a mature arc with respect to that trench defines the geometry of the system. So that's an important point I wanted to make. Uh, the history of IODP uh, uh, involvement in the Izu Bonin Mariana system commenced with the science plan, which has almost reached its end, uh, the decade of drilling, and there were a variety of uh, topics like the earth connection section, where subduction zone initiation, volatile cycling through subduction zones and continental crust generation were an important target. So as a result of the uh, scientific imprimata of respectability, a number of expeditions were uh, executed in 2014 and some of the logic behind where the ship was taken to drill had been guided by uh, various people and a lot of scientific interest in the initiation of subduction. And, but I just mentioned this paper by Bob Stern, which stimulated a lot of thought. Subduction initiation spontaneous and induced. And Bob attempted to categorize the different kinds of island arcs that might develop in different tectonic systems. For example, induced uh, subduction initiation, he equated with a process that is occurring somewhere else or some other process that's happened, such as, for example, in the case of the Solomon's, Solomon's New Hebrides, in the Miocene of a polarity reversal, consequent to the arrival of the Antong Java Plateau, which is here, these green blobs, over thickened crust, 30 kilometers perhaps or more, the arrival on the Pacific Plate at about uh, 10 million years ago, and as a consequence of choking of the subduction zones, the polarity of the subduction system flipped. Uh, so that the Australian plate is now being subducted below the uh, Pacific plate. So all of these uh, locations Bob was categorizing in terms of the type of setting that had occurred to initiate the subduction. As opposed to induced, Bob recognized uh, spontaneous subduction, where, for example, although there are no Cenozoic examples, a, a collapse at a passive margin, that maybe you might think that this is the Atlantic margin of North America or South America or, or it's, it's their uh, equivalents on the east side of the Atlantic. We, don't, we do not have any examples of these. In the Western Pacific, it's been a long held idea, hypothesis, that a change of plate motions around 50 million years ago led to a cannibalization of a transform fault, here labeled T, so that what had formerly been a uh, transform fault became, as a result of changes in plate motions, a subduction zone. And this is a, if you like, a guiding model that many people have uh, come to uh, accept that might have led to the rise of the Izu Bonin Mariana system. Uh, and I'll show you some more cartoons of how that might have occurred. There are others that uh, uh, Bob recognized, such as uh, plume head, margin collapse. And there's another one that I wanted to show you that, well, perhaps we shouldn't pigeonhole uh, as, it, as N members, all these subduction zone systems, and the Western Pacific, the Izubon in Mariana system clearly could be considered not as a simple conversion of a single transform fault into a subduction zone, but it, there was a pre-existing uh, cluster of Mesozoic island arcs and perhaps older systems that triggered, you know, in the case of changes in plate motions, for subduction to be taking place alongside the light of buoyant crust, but this requires some prehistory to the arc. This is not a intra-oceanic transform fault that's been converted to abduction zone. It's neighboring a pre-existing set of relatively low density crust. And I think there, there may well be a case for saying that the uh, Izubon in Mariana system was an example of this. And I'll show you some cartoons, which perhaps uh, give, give some credence to that idea. Now, in terms of uh, plate motion changes, it's widely known, and here's a paper that I've referenced from Whitaker et al, that there was a major change in plate motions around uh, 55 million years ago. Consequence, and since we're talking uh, about the Western Pacific, consequent to the swallowing of the Pacific Izanagi Ridge along the east margin of Asia. That led to some drastic changes in plate motions, configured here by uh, Whitaker et al, from something northwestwards, as a result of extra slab drag and failure of uh, the, the plate system to keep dragging the Pacific in one direction to something more westerly. So this, this is not a ch necessarily a change in uh, a event solely associated with the swallowing of the Pacific Izanagi Ridge. 
but also there were other things happening at the same time, like the uh, more rapid separation of Australia from Antarctica, uh, the harder collision of India with Asia and so on. But nevertheless, it's agreed that something happened around 55 million years ago. Now, the ocean drilling program targeted in three expeditions in 2014, a hole in the rear arc, an expedition addressing what was going on in the rear arc, a hole here, U1438 in the Amami Senkaku Basin, and a hole in the uh, current fore arc, several holes, north of the classic Bonanite location of Chichijima. And of course, those pillar lavas that I showed you in the opening slide uh, are from uh, uh, Chichijima. So I'm going to spend some time talking about the results from in these expeditions, the one in what is now a far rear arc and what is now the fore arc. I've got hole 786 here, which is drilled on leg 125, because later on I'll talk about the variety of boninites and basalts that were erupted around 50 million years ago along the full length of the Mariana to Bonin arc. So <laughs> an important point to make, what you're looking at there in that, uh, in that map is the Philippine Sea Plate, bounded on the east by the Izu Bonin Mariana Trench, to the west by the Ryukyu Trench and the, uh, the trenches uh, uh, to the east of the Philippines and so on. The history of this plate has been dominated by seafloor spreading. So Interridge, I'm sure, has a major interest in, in what has been going on in the development of this plate. What's its history? What's been going on along, around, around the margins? This is the uh, Expedition 351 Amami Sankaku Basin site, U1438. It was drilled uh, on a piece of what looked like standard oceanic crust. The hypothesis pre-expedition was that this was ordinary oceanic crust, possibly Mesozoic in age, which, would, which underlay the development of the first arc, which were the strata volcanoes forming the Kyushu Palau Ridge. This is now a remnant arc left behind by spreading in the Shikoku Basin and the Paraisi Vela Basin from the currently active arc to the east. So what we were hoping for was to find a basement here, an oceanic crust, which would underlie all the other arc system developed on top of it, and which may contribute in various ways to that arc, including defining the mantle composition for the first wedge that was tapped during the initial creation of these strata volcanoes. Well, it's great to go and drill something for real and find out to your surprise that it's not what you thought it was. But these are those the, the seismic lines through that site that we used, uh, about 1500 meters of sediment at about nearly five kilometers depth of water. And we penetrated through all this sediment, which mostly recorded uh, paraclastic material derived from the growing Kyushu Palo uh, uh, Ridge in the uh, Eocene to Oligocene. Uh, and also the expedition penetrated 150 meters into the basaltic basement. And that's an important point I want to make. All right, so to our surprise, a number of things. First of all, uh, the nature of this uh, at the base here, unit one, and then these Roman numerals four, three, two, one, all of these uh, units, four, three, two, one, are essentially sedimentary units that overlie the oceanic crust. So this, these sedimentary units really constitute, comprise layer one of the oceanic crust. Layer two is the igneous oceanic crust, 150 meters of it. And in this colored, colored column here, units, subunit 1A, 1B, and so on and all, all this. These are basaltic lava flows, sheet flows, pillow lavas, some interleaving sediments, so it wasn't a continuum of eruptive activity. And I've re referred you here to two papers that have been published recently. One by uh, Hurt Lee et al in Nature Communications and one by Yuki Kusano about the processes leading to the emplacement of these basalts in the early Izu Bonin Mariana system. The green dots represent the compositions of uh, the magnesium numbers of clinoperoxine. You'll see that there are some very magnesium uh, uh, phenocrysts phen here up to uh, magnesium numbers of 94, 95. The orangey triangles are the plagioclase composition, the anathite content. And the green squares through here are the bulk MG, uh, MG numbers of the rocks. Unit 1A has probably been affected by seawater alteration, though many of the phenocrysts appear pristine and not altered, but the majority of this uh, material is surprisingly fresh. 
Here on the right hand side of the screen are some examples of um, uh, thin sections of unit one basalts. Uh, the mineralogy is of interest with respect in contrast to mid ocean ridge basalts. For example, on the left hand side, uh, I have shown you some uh, reflected light photomicrographs of spinel that are contained within uh, some of the subunits of the unit one basalt. And the key thing here is these are aluminium chrome rich spinels zoned all the way through to magnetite compositions. So they are typically, typically contained within olivine and the other phenocrysts present, variably present, because some of these are very fine grained rocks. So calling them phenocrysts is an exaggeration. But the other mineralogy, which is important, uh, Phosphoritic olivines, which, which in fact get up to phosphorite 92, uh, very calcic plagioclases, and aluminous clinoperoxines with, as you saw earlier, magnesium numbers less than uh, magnesium uh, number 95. Uh, the crystallization order here, which is possible to determine because of trace element characteristics of these different phases, would be first spinel, followed by olivine, followed by plagioclase, followed by the clinoperoxine. There's nothing unusual about that crystallization sequence. What is unusual and rare in mid ocean ridge basalts is the aluminous chrome rich spinels. I'll show you some diagrams that will show you this. And also the pres preservation of clinoperoxine. It's, clinoperoxine is a rare phase uh, in mid ocean ridge basalts. So it's obviously important in the fractionation, the development, magma mixing, all the other processes that take place uh, in the sub ridge magma chambers. So we can come back to what that might mean in the case of the genesis of these unit one basalts in a while. Now, the following expedition returned to the four arc of the Izubonin system, north of Chichijima. Here's one of the many papers that have been uh, published uh, about the recovery of various uh, rock types in the four arc. So we're some distance north of Chichijima and across the schematic diagram would show you the, 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 the stratigraphy which is inferred from these sites and which had been uh, more or less uh, constructed prior to this expedition. But the expedition recovered some beautiful samples and these were, have been dated accurately. And what you're seeing here is uh, a rock type called four arc basalt. And here are the Boninites, which have been the classic early uh, development of um, arc systems that have been recognized around the world. And for example, give, give, give an indication that uh, for, in Trudos that uh, maybe that ophiolite was erupt, erupted in place in an island arc system. Many samples, many, much, an, an incredible amount of data have been generated from both expeditions, 351 and 352. And here are some uh, photomicrographs of what has been called a four arc basalt. Now, just as an aside, and I'm not alone in this, I think calling, and uh, the authors know about my views about this, calling these four arc basalts uh, in the absence of a defining geography of the arc system at 51 million years ago is probably a mistake. It's a mistake to call any rock unit after a, uh, a locality where the locality did not probably exist at the time they were in place, or a, uh, perhaps uh, also a temporal uh, name. For example, for what have been called four arc basalts in the case of the Izu Bonin system, have been recognized as some of the earliest products in Central America and in the T Tonga or Vityaz arc. And there they've been called proto arc basalts. And the difficulty with this is that sooner or later you will discover this kind of basalt type somewhere other than the four arc or somewhere other than uh, the proto arc. So uh, I think it's a mistake, but there it is, it's in the literature and we're gonna be living with it for a while, yes. In the case of uh, these four arc basalts, the mineralogy is similar, except they have not uh, discovered any of these unusual aluminous chrome rich spinels. Now, uh, some ge trace element geochemistry with some references to uh, mid ocean ridge basalt types. At site 1438, unit one, <clears throat> this is a multi element diagram. So the rare earth elements are embedded in here, and so some of the other uh, immobile, fluid immobile, incompatible elements. And some of the subunits, 1C, 1E. 1E is the most primitive, highest magnesium number for ex with the exclusion of the 1A unit, which may have been altered by seawater. And here are some representative morbs from Hoffman, Gaelidel, Revelo and McDonough, and so on. 
The point about these rare earth element patterns are they're up to an order of magnitude more depleted in light rare earths uh, than uh, any mid-ocean rich basalt type. So we know straight away that, uh, that we're dealing with a basalt that's been derived from a more prior melt depleted source than the majority of the global mid-ocean ridge basalt system. So bear that in mind as we go on. Another point to make about this is there's not a sign of the archetypal subducted slab inputs to a source of an arc basalt. These, these, the blue and the, uh, this, whatever color this is, the, these patterns to have none of the spikes, depressions, nodum tantalum, or spikes in terms of uh, uh, thorium that one would see in an island arc basalt. So there's no indication of the orthodox type of slab input into some of these uh, uh, basalts from the base of site 1438. By the way, I, I should have told you that the ages of these basalts are at site 1438 are around 49 million years. The ages of the four arc basalts recovered by Expedition 352 are around 51 million years. So the, the site 1438 materials are definitely younger by a couple of million years than those recovered from the four arc. So here's another uh, way of looking at, uh, well, here's a comparison And the fab recovered from the forearm by previous dredging. These guys, these basalt types from site 1438 are more depleted in light rare earths than those from the forearm sites. Paper by Rick, uh, Rosemary Hickey Vargas et al. in Geochemical Cosmic Chemical Active will give you all these data. Here are some uh, enriched and depleted four arc basalt types which span the range from th these sites on Expedition 352. Paper by John Shervais et al. in G cubed. So they have, of course, many more data than I'm showing you here. These are just some representative end member examples. We know a lot about the isotopic characteristics of both uh, the site 1438 and the four arc uh, sites and here in an epsilon hafnium epsilon near dimium diagrams from a paper by Jean Yogajinsky et al you'll see that the basement the unit one radiogenic hafnium radiogenic uh, four arc basalts what this requires is a source that's been depleted in the incompatible elements, uh, hafnium relative to lutetium, for a long time, allowing you to build up the radiogenic hafnium. And we're talking several hundred million years. This is not a process that took place during the course of the generation of these basalts. We're talking in terms of rare earth element patterns and also the hafnium neodymium isotopes of something that's been derived from a highly depleted and long-term depleted mantle source. You notice these also uh, from unit one and the uh, four arc all plot in the Indian uh, field compared with the Pacific field or the majority of them do. Here's a paper by Lee et al on all of the Expedition 352 uh, material. Eight in the Philippine Sea this is Indian domain. And uh, in terms of some of the other crust outboard of the Izu Bonin Mariana system, like 801 was a site drilled outboard of the Marianas, 1149 outboard of the Izu Bonin system into the Pacific crust that's being subducted uh, below the IBM system. And there's a distinct uh, isotopic contrast, which has been known now for a number of years. All right. Here are some papers which I have just indicated might, uh, if you're interested, give you some of the most recent uh, discussions, data presentations uh, that are available on this system. Uh, the paper by Ishizuka et al. talks about the record from the Bonin Islands, in other words, Chichijima and the neighboring islands, and compares that with the recoveries from Expedition 352. I wrote a paper with Julian Pierce, which is in the Encyclopedia of Geology uh, on Boninites, uh, I'll come to another paper about Bonanites shortly. 
Uh, David Coulthard et al. Have, got, have published a huge amount of data uh, from the four arc basalts and Bonnenites from Expedition 352. And a recent paper uh, by Mary Jo Brouts et al. has been looking at slab traces, volatiles, and oxidation during subduction initiation of much of the Expedition 352 materials. <coughs> now, I told uh, you in the uh, abstract that I would spend some time uh, touting the uh, usefulness of a, uh, an approach uh, developed by Hugh O'Neill, who's on, on the, uh, in the webinar. Uh, it, this paper called uh, The Smoothness and Shapes of Chondrite Normalized Rare Earth Element Patterns in Basalts. I urge you to start using this uh, as a very useful tool for comparing large amounts of data and looking at rare earth element patterns. Hugh made various points in that paper, one of which is that we can precisely determine the abundances of, of all the rare earth elements very accurately. If you just look at patterns and say, oh, well, one's slightly enriched in light rare earths compared with another one, you're wasting a lot of the quantifiable information that's contained in those curves and lines. And a mathematical approach is because mathematicians love lines, they can tell you a lot about the curvature, curvature of curvature, in other words, sinusoidal systems and so on. So we, I'm gonna show you in, shortly, where do the uh, global mid-ocean basalts fall? Where do uh, Expedition 351, Unit 1 basalts, where do the 4 arc basalts fall and on, on these kind of patterns? And you'll be able to see that there's distinct differences among these that are visible with this approach that Hugh, Hugh developed which are not so obvious when you just look at the patterns. Don't waste your data, start turning it into quantifiable uh, uh, observations and comparability from one place to another. So the gray dots there are from the Jenna and O'Neill um, Global Mid-Ocean Basalt data set. And what you're looking at is where do they plot on a diagram which plots the slope of the rare earth element pattern compared with its curvature. So down at this end, these gray dots, single samples, you're looking at the light, the characteristic light rare earth element depleted relative to the medium and heavy of mid-ocean ridge basalts. The ones that plot up the top end of this array are the, if you like, enriched morb, which have light rare earth element enrichment. Boninites plot up here with kind of U-shaped patterns. Things that plot down here, these are data from Hawaii, the, the Kilauea tholeites. Signature of garnet, steep lanthanum meterbium patterns, uh, and quite clearly derived from a different source than uh, those from mid-ocean ridges. Different source in a sense with a stable mineralogy at higher pressures, which is garnet. Now, all of this is quantifiable. And if you want to play games with comparing your data and uh, how you can model this, a couple of PhD students and now postdocs of ours, uh, staff members, have a paper in mathematical geosciences with an app which you can use to educate yourself in how to use these kind of diagrams. Now here's just to show you well, where did some of your favorite curves lie? Here's some examples of chondrite normalized rare earths, and I've exaggerated this, but this green dotted diamond shaped uh, decoration would be a simple curve, light rare earth element depleted. Here's a sinusoidal curve, light rare earth enriched, heavy rare earth element depleted, a kind of Hawaiian tholeite, but not really. And what do these look like on the lambda lambda diagrams, curvature slope? Here's the curvature, here's the slope, green dot, this is at the bottom end of the uh, Morb array. Here is something that's got uh, the sig sigmoidal Hawaii-like uh, pattern. Uh, something that's a simple curve, brown, light earth enriched, if you like, an E-type more. So you can do this for yourself. Now, to the meat of this argument and the usefulness of the, uh, this approach. Here are the MORB uh, data array of Jenner O'Neill. Uh, here are the unit one basalts in green. Here are all, well, all at that time, the four up results that we knew of and the, all the data that's come from Expedition 352 has kind of confirmed that uh, th this, this occupation, this uh, curvature slope space of what I've got on this diagram. The green dots don't plot in the same place as the red dots. Unequivocally, they are different. And the green dots are coming from a source. And in fact, the other advantage of this lambda approach is that the source must have a steeper slope and a steeper curvature, it would be offset to the left, and it's possible to quantify that, from the bottom most of these uh, green dots. The source of, in the mantle, of the unit one basalts is out here. The source, sorry, let me go back. The source of the fab is off here. They're coming from different sources. At the period when they were, these basalts were being generated at the order of 50 million years ago. All right, unequivocally different.
Here's some other uh, materials that I plotted on a lambda lambda diagram. Here is the uh, paper about uh, Boninite series melts, a new classification approach by Valatich et al. in Journal of Petrology. Uh, this is a paper published by Hurt Lee and others uh, uh, describing the uh, trace element geochemistry and the mineralogy of, for example, the spinels I showed you early from the early Izu Bonin Marianic development in Nature Communications. Green dots, unit one. Red dots buried here, fab, plus those from Expedition 352, these various blue squares, all plotting in the same place. Sundry back arc basin basalts from the Philippine Sea Plate, West Philippine Basin, Shikoku, and so on. If you like them, uh, and I know Hugh, for, for example, regards this as a nonsense, here are the typical N, D, and E type more from Gale et al. And the other dots, the lighter gray dots I have here, are from the Gale et al database. And you'll see there's extensive overlap between the General O'Neill and the Gale et al. database. Here are Boninites from various sources of information uh, published in the uh, Valetich et al. paper. Here are the spoon-shaped patterns, the dish-shaped patterns of Boninites. And again, uh, light earth enrichment, light earth element depletion. Incidentally, the, uh, the basalt types from the Mid-Ocean ridges that plot close to the fab are basalts from along the Reykjanes ridge. Uh, published by um, Bram Merton et al. So uh, we do know of other places that have rare earth patterns that look like fab. Now you can uh, indulge yourself and look at, uh, for example, curvature, lambda two, against curvature of curvature. And this is the sinusoidal area. Here are the green dots, the red dots and blue dots are buried in here. And again, the unit one basalts from site uh, U1438, Expedition 351 are different clearly separate from all of the fab. What, what you're looking at here, this sort of higher lambda three, is the stiffening. It's almost like a knee, just a simple leg, that there's a slope for the leg part, the thigh, and a slope for the shin part, and there isn't really a bend in the fabs. They tend to have a, a stiffer, knee-looking like rare earth element pattern. I've never seen that term used. We should adopt it, a knee pattern rather than a continuous curvature. That just shows you the merits of looking at the curvature of, the, of these chondrite normalized patterns. Okay, back to uh, some mineralogy of the uh, unit one. Uh, these are the spinel compositions. All these green dots are from unit one and then some others that are uh, in uh, various units of uh, the unit one that occur in a moment, I'll show you crossing into different fields. The important point here is these unit one uh, spinels get more to be more luminous than any uh, spinels we've yet to see in mineral basalts. So buried up here, this square is spinel in morbs from people published by, for example, by people like uh, Harold Sigurdsson and John Gee Schilling. And they're zoned all the way through from aluminous rich to chrome rich to magnetite up at the top here. Here are the spinels in uh, mineral basalts. This red line is the maximum Mg number, uh, chrome number of uh, spinel in uh, abyssal peridotites. The green dots are those from the unit one and there's, as you see, zoned all the way out here through to magnetite. On a similar ferric Fe3 plus no, uh, value versus magnesium number. And these guys tend to have some of the lowest ferric numbers of any spinel in any mid-ocean ridge basalt or any of these early arc basalts, probably reflecting a more reduced environment of generation than in the case of mid-ocean ridges. And just to cap it all off, if you like this, here's a uh, uh, titanium number. So this should be obliterated. It comes from previous diagrams. It's titanium weight percent against alumina. It's deep from Dima Kamenetsky. And you see these spinels cover the whole range. If you're a fan of tectonic environment inferred from spinel chemistry, be careful. This goes from arc, morb, oib, lips, all the way through to, well, magnetite. Now, I've told you these basalts come from a highly refractory, prior melt depleted source. The, 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 one of the immediate questions one might turn to here is, how do you get this highly depleted mantle to melt? I mean, you told us earlier that there's no slab input, perhaps no water, no sign of excess barium or thorium or any other slab signatures. Wouldn't this be, uh, wouldn't this require extra uh, a higher temperature of generation since the solidus of a refractory pridotite 
ought to be a lot higher than a fertile prototype. So the thermobarometry that's been done on all this stuff uh, doesn't show you that the unit one basalts or the fabs are particularly hotter than morb. Here, for example, is the construction by Hickey Vargas et al. Uh, the paper by Hurt Lee et al. would have produced a similar kind of thing using the uh, Hertzberg and Asimov algorithms. Uh, the uh, John Shervey's did a similar kind of thing for the uh, fab uh, out in the Izu Bonin Forark. So all of this, the gray field here is for more. And you see there's not, a, not an obvious uh, displacement to any higher temperature here of the, uh, these uh, highly depleted basalts. So what else could be going on? Well, I, uh, I think like many people, we thought, well, there's no, there's no subduction zone signature here, presuming there's no water. Well, this is from the recent paper by Mary Jo Brance of water contents versus MGO of FAB. And th th they don't make this point, but I think my, a comment I would like to make about this diagram is these are highly depleted basalts. If you adopt the approach, say, of, oh, cerium behaves like water in the source of the mantle, and certainly in mid-ocean basalts, we can kind of correlate cerium water, water cerium contents uh, with perhaps uh, magnetite, depleted, enriched, all that sort of stuff. The cerium contents of fab and, or, sorry, the cerium content, contents of unit one basalts are down at two ppm, highly depleted. If you took a ratio of water to cerium of 200, you'd be talking down here on this axis of 0.04% weight percent water, barely visible above basement here. The fact is, some of these Thorock basalts, and we don't have similar glasses from which we can obtain equivalent data for the unit one basalts, some of these glasses contain substantially more water than that, an order of magnitude more. So I think there's some evidence argued by people like Mary Jo Browns and others that something has been coming from the slab that may have triggered the melting. So it's not bone dry, it's moist. And then the, not that that would get you off the hook in terms of uh, the solidus temperature versus what you actually then melt uh, the, the mantle below these uh, early arc systems is like, but nevertheless it would help if it was moist, perhaps from serpent serpentine dehydration. All right, I was going to spend a little bit of time telling you something more about the complications of the Unit 1 site and where things were coming from. You can get this reference and the information from a paper by Waldman et al, so I'm not going to spend time talking about it, just show you this one diagram. Here's the Unit 1 basalts over at site U1438. What recon is recognized by Warman et al. is out to the east here is the Izubonin arc, the four arc sites, and out to the west here is inferred to be an early arc volcano. How early? Like 48 to 47 million years ago, when we'd finished making the basement at site 1438, a volcano appeared, not at where the, the Kyushu Palo Ridge is going to appear, which is off here somewhere, out here to the east. But this was somewhere in the neighborhood and quite where, we don't know, but it was close enough to be putting lava flows and uh, uh, pyroclastic material into the sedimentary cover immediately overlying the basement. And here's some cartoons uh, that show you this. Early volcano, God knows what it was doing out there. And here's the Kyushu Palo uh, Arc starting to develop uh, in the late Eocene. All right, now I want to turn to a complication. You probably had enough of complications, but here's one more for you. That it's a mistake to treat the Izu Bonin Mariana system as a two dimensional thing. Uh, it's, it's in three dimensions, uh, both uh, compositionally and temporally, what was going on. So, this is an abstract that I uh, presented with Brian Taylor at the 2019 uh, four meeting. And here, let me just tell you what the summary of all this was. First ma erupted magma at IBM inception was the low K titanium thorlytic basalt, otherwise known as FAB, at 52 million years at these sites. Within the first 4 million years, 52 to 48 million years, similar basalt, with the caveat that, uh, of course, the trace element chemistry and all the rest of it is di slightly different, was erupted a long strike and a cross strike. So 12 degrees north, 18 degrees north, 32 degrees north, along the strike of the Izu Bonin Mariana system, similar basalt was being erupted within this time period, and a cross strike all the way in this Nami Senkaku basin. The basalt compositions vary systematically between these sites. They're not all the same, as I've already indicated with respect to the comparisons between 1438 and FAB. 
And after reconstruction of the relationships, what we think is that there's a long strike pre Izu Bonin mantle heterogeneity, which was established by the Mesozoic arc systems or some other process before the inception of the Izu Bonin Mariana arc. So, what are we talking about? This yellow dot here is Site 786. It's also the place where uh, Shinkai dies, recovered essentially four arc basalt at this latitude. Here's Site 1438. Here are the expedition sites. There are other sites along the, uh, the Mariana Arc where what would be called four arc basalts have been recovered. So these are what I'm going to show you now from, uh, if you like, 12 degrees north, uh, 20, 32 degrees north up here, which is its ODP site uh, 786, the uh, Shinkai dives and so on. So let's just have a look at some of the chemistry. Uh, this you can look at at your leisure later uh, in terms of where I'm getting this material from. Here is the slope versus curvature lambda diagram. Green dots are the uh, unit one basalts. All these blue dots here are the fab. I'm sorry I changed the color on you. These were red in previous diagrams. These guys, these red triangles, are from the 32 degrees north four arc. These are fab. Uh, these guys, the blue squares, are from down in the Maris. And so the important point here is to the north, the mantle source of these four arc basalts is changing. So the source material is changing. It's not all the same mantle at subduction inception. Skip that. Well, these are uh, reverting though to two deep cross sections. These are from uh, Mark Reagan et al's paper, uh, timing paper in uh, uh, Earth and Planetary Science letters. So just to show you what the orthodox view of what was happening at around 52 million years to uh, in the early stages of the art development. Something happened here, the transformed fault converted into a, uh, a suture zone where the sinking Pacific plate started apparently rolling back upwelling the scenosphere, no interaction except for becoming moist with the slab derived fluid. Uh, this develops pretty quickly, proto four arc spreading. And this is where the, uh, first of all, the fab is being developed followed by boninites. And here is the expedition 351, 352, where they were drilling relative to this kind of cartoon. It's a two dimensional view, uh, but we should know that 351 sites were not originally adjacent across the strike to 352 sites. Soon, let's just have a look at some of these cartoons. Uh, this is the old idea of Ueda and Ben Abraham, published in 1972, Cooler Pacific Ridge, which would now be called the Izanagi Pacific Ridge, conversion of this as a result of change plate motions of the Pacific plate relative to Asia uh, and cannibalization of that transform fault. This depicts an environment which is all truly oceanic, but we know that's not the case, although it's a great idea. Uh, Maria Seaton and I'll have a, a, a recent version of what was going on along this East Asian margin with the swallowing of the Pacific Izanagi Ridge. That's 60 million years ago. 50 million years ago, once the ridge becomes swallowed below East Asia, the plate motion of the Pacific changes. And you'll see here what they've depicted as some kind of transform fault boundary gets converted into a subduction zone. Except this area here is a whole group of Mesozoic arcs. That idea was developed further by Serge Lallemand and colleagues. And you can look at that paper and see, well, here's the Izanagi Pacific Ridge, some kind of transform boundary down to an extension of that ridge and conversion of this into the Izu Bonin Mariana subduction system. And the final thing I was gonna say, another, as you, I hope you begun, would have begun to appreciate a Lambda Lambda diagram saying you don't have to have a refractory mantle source to become involved or to locate a subduction zone initiation. For example, here, the green dots from the uh, unit one basalts, blue dots, fab. These guys in here, this says Fiji T. Uh, this is Todd et al's uh, paper and data from the Vitez arc inception. And these guys, they're different from the blue and the green, and they do not come from as depleted sources in the case of the inception of the Vitez arc 50 million years ago as those from the Izu Bonin Mariana system. Same would be true of Central America. So it's, it's, it's the case in Izu Bonin Mariana that we had highly depleted sources involved, but I don't think that's a requirement for locating where a subduction zone might develop. All right, so these are the main points I've been trying to make in this talk. 
Ultra-refractory mantle sources lacking archetypal subduction inputs were melted during the early stages of easy bonding convergent margin development. These sources don't seem to be required for establishing the subduction zones, uh, for example, Central America or Vitez. Transition from a dispersed extensional regime to a focused trench parallel chain of stratovolcanoes, which defines the arc, fore arc, rear arc, back arc geometry, occurred within a few million years of subduction initiation. In other words, this is the Kyushu Palo Ridge. It doesn't take long to focus the magnetism uh, along one, one, one locus uh, compared with its dispersed environment initially. And pre Izubonin upper mantle heterogeneities manifest in the earliest Izubonin magmatic compositions. Uh, and that's all I have for you. Thanks.